Welcome and thank you for standing by. Today's call is being recorded. All participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I would now like to turn the conference over to Dr. Heather Brown. You may begin. Thank you, operator. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar. Um, we're going to get started right out the gate, um, and so we have time for any questions that you want to ask. Um, this session is going to be on misadvent the misadventures in money management. I'll try to say that three times quickly, um, and we call it MIMM or MIM for short. And it's talk it's basically the session is about a wonderful tool that we have that incorporated gam gam gamification and storytelling into financial education. So we want to share that with you, and I think that a lot of different intermediaries and financial educators have found a lot of creative uses for this tool and we'd like to share some of those for you, but certainly um, the audience that it's targeted at um, will really appreciate it um, if, when you're working with service members and those in JROTC or ROTC. Um, I want to take a minute and um, introduce our guest speaker today. Um, her name is Michelle Glass. She is a financial education program analyst in the Office of Service Member Affairs at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, she started her position in that role on August 24th of 2014. So that's only a couple years after the Bureau was started. So she's been there from almost the beginning. Um, she brings a wealth of knowledge based on her years of service in nonprofit uh, community, in the nonprofit community, helping veterans and their family members resolve financial issues. Uh, Michelle began teaching financial literacy after inventing an educational finance board game and card game under her own organization, her own company, and she sold that company to Consumer Credit Counseling Service Firm in 2007. So she was on the bleeding edge of technology, as we say, back uh, in that time, coming up with uh, these new financial education tools that are interactive. And we're so fortunate to have her here at the Bureau. Uh, prior to joining CFPB, she was Vice President of Education for Clearpoint Credit Counseling Solutions for seven years, and she managed a team of community, community development officers across 15 states. She has a her she's certified as a project management professional, a PMP. She worked for IBM as an international IT project manager for over 10 years, and she's also an Army veteran and served over 16 months in foreign service during the Persian Gulf War. Um, she has a master's from the University of Oklahoma in international relations, and she received her bachelor's from Kennesaw State University in international affairs. In addition to her PMP, she also has a SAC PPM. Um, and those of you that are, interact a lot with government will know that that is the federal equivalent of a PMP, and she's at a level three, which is the highest level that you can be at. Um, so she leads the office's program on misadventures in money management, and um, she uh, is planning some expansion on that um, at some point in the future. And um, she's also a financial educator, a published author, and a successful entrepreneur in addition to her military service. So, Michelle, we thank you for your military service, and we welcome you. I'm going to go through some um, preliminary slides first, um, and then we're going to hand it over to Michelle to do her presentation and demonstration. Um, the disclaimer that I must read is that the, this presentation is being made by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, representatives, myself and Michelle, on behalf of the Bureau, it does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the Bureau. Any opinions or views stated by us are our own views and may not represent the Bureau's views. Any inclusion of links or references to third-party sites does not necessarily reflect the Bureau's endorsement of that site or the third party's products or services that they offer. The Bureau has not vetted necessarily all third-party sites, their content and products that they offer, and there may also be other entities or resources that are not listed that may also serve your needs in those cases. All right, um, about the Bureau, um, you, most of you know the Bureau, uh, Bureau of Consu uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau regulates the offering and provision of consumer financial products and services from under the federal consumer financial laws and educates and empowers consumers to make better and informed decisions. This is our Finex slide, and um, it talks about the things that our Finex programs offer. Most of you get the mailing, so you're aware of it, and that's how you knew about this. But if you got this notification, 
from a colleague and you have not gotten a direct mailing from us telling you about webinars in the last 30 days, then you might need to send an email to the um, box at the bottom, cfpb underscore finex at cfpb.gov, and join the finex list so that you can get advanced notification of all of our resources and webinars. In addition to the webinars um, and the newsletter, we do regional convenings um, out in the field, and if that's something um, you're interested in, reach out to us and let us know as we're planning our schedule for next year's regional meetings. We have a regional meeting coming up um, in Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin and another one uh, coming up in West Virginia um, at West Virginia University Center for Financial Education. So if you're nearby either of those and you're interested, send me an email to the CFPB box, and we will make sure you're on the list uh, to be invited to that. Okay, um, let's move on here. Also, all of our past webinars are posted on our website. And so if, if you go to this page and the links at the bottom of this slide, you will see the upcoming webinar posted here. Um, and if you go to the right of that box, you will see the email address box. You could actually put an email in there to join the CFPB list. Um, we're hoping to expand the list to include full business card information soon so that we can do more outreach in the regions by region and have that zip code and city state information. Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully that will be coming up. But in the meantime, you can also send an email with a copy of your business card to the CFPB underscore Phoenix box and I will add you and all of your business card information so you will be getting inv invitations to things that happen regionally. Okay, and our last slide just kind of covers the highlights of our web, the web pages for the Finex program. Um, the first one is the adult financial education page. Um, if you go under consumerfinance.gov and then you go to practitioners, um, if you're doing it by clicking the, the menu items, then you'll come to um, a choice for adult financial education. And all of the resources um, and publications and past webinars um, are all on the, that, at that location. So that's where you want to go for that. You're welcome to download our past slides and reuse them as long as you don't change them if you keep our logo on it. And if you want to change them, you're welcome to do that. But you need to take our logo off and put your logo on. Um, and then you can also be a part of our LinkedIn group, and many of you are already, and you can check in there and um, see that we're getting more and more announcements every week, and um, it's a great place to get updates on what's going on. And you can also ask questions or ask about resources. The only thing we ask is that you don't market things for profit um, through that site and that you keep it relevant to an audience of financial educators. And with that, um, I think we'll move to um, Michelle now. I'm going to pull her slides up. And pass the ball to her so that she can control her slides. And I want the audience also to be aware that you may ask questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. You can usually, uh, some people use the chat for everything, chat and Q&A. Um, and you can also send me a private message by clicking to the two button in the drop down, and that would come um, just to Heather Brown if you had something you wanted to just ask me. Um, but if you ask a question, you might want to do all participants because people may have the same question, or if they didn't have it, they may benefit from the answer as well. And um, I think I mentioned that you can download the slides later. We'll have those posted up within the next couple of weeks, so you can download the past slides. And if you have a question, if you enter it in the chat, we'll get to it at the end, and we'll also open the lines at the end so that you can ask questions. All right, with that, I'm finished with my introductory comments, and I am going to pass it over to Michelle. Michelle, are you all set? Yes, thank you, Dr. Brown. I appreciate that introduction. Thank you very much. And welcome to everyone who has joined us on this webinar today. I'm very excited to be here to talk about OSA's flagship program, Misadventures in Money Management, which can be found at mim.gov. That's M-I-M-M.gov. Uh, this is a tool that we designed specifically for service members, but don't fear because even though it's got great information that we built for service members, any person can use it. So this is open to share with other people 
in the community who want to learn about personal finance. And now I'm going to see if I can page to the next page. You're moving it. Thanks. Perfect. <laughs> the as you probably know, many of you that are on here, um, the Dodd-Frank Act established the Office of Service Member Affairs. And um, there are three things that our office is statutorily mandated to do. The first is to educate and empower service members and their families to make better informed decisions regarding consumer financial products. The second thing we do is we monitor and we analyze consumer complaints that are submitted by service members and their families. And then the third thing is we coordinate efforts among other federal and state agencies as appropriate regarding consumer financial protection measures related to um, consumer financial products and services that are offered to or used by service members and their family. So as you can see, we have a lot of things that we do. Okay, so this came back to my agenda. There it goes. All right. So what I'm going to talk about, um, again, is talk about our office, which I just did. I want to talk to you about some of the challenges that young service members face, which is why we designed the Miss Adventures in Money program. And I want to give you a demonstration of that program today, and then I'm going to talk about some outcomes that we've seen from implementing the program. And I think you know enough about me. So. Service members regularly interact with financial products throughout their life cycle when they're in military service. For most service members, financial products help them move to a new city or to a new country. Um, it helps them to fund an education, buy a home, start a family, uh, manage those unexpected bumps in the road. But when you're serving in the military, it also involves many unique challenges not found with other professions like not being in control of when and where you're going to move because service members and their families are regularly relocating from duty station to duty station. And then when financial issues go wrong, the effect on their lives can be amplified. This slide is showing some examples of the rates at which service members and veterans use some of the common financial products and services that civilians use, for example. 97% of all service members have a checking account or a savings account. 91% of service members are more likely to have a credit card than non-service members. And one-third of service members have four or more credit cards in their name. Over 60% of service members have a car loan or a lease, or they're making some type of monthly payment on a car. Now, the challenges that young service members face, it can be, it can be pretty impactful on them. Because if they're distracted by financial problems, then they can't do their jobs to the best of their ability. And if the problems get too out of hand, then it can really hurt their career. So on this slide, it shows that an average of 3,400 to 8,000 service members are separated each year from the military because of financial issues. And these separations take a real toll, not just on the service member, but on their families as well but it also costs the government hundreds of millions of dollars a year to recruit and replace those service members that are um, leaving the service due to those financial issues. And then recently, the Department of Defense announced that they were implementing a new security clearance rule that makes it even more important that a service member resolves any credit reporting or uh, debt collection issue as quickly as possible because previously, what DOD was doing was they were doing background checks that were periodically done like every five years. And so service members had a chance to check their credit history and clean up any errors, and you know they could review those within that five years. But now DOD is implementing a continuously monitoring policy that will automatically check the service member's credit history. So that's why it's very important for them to be on top of their personal finances. Now let's talk about misadventures and money management. 
Misadventures is an online graphic novel meets choose your own adventure virtual learning experience that incorporates video bookends. And when I talk about video bookends, I'm meaning that it's, you know, you're Picture yourself looking at a comic book online, but before the comic book starts, there's a video that introduces you to the character, and then you will choose through that graphic novel which path that character takes when they make certain financial decisions. You will actually um, make those decisions for the character. And then at the end, depending upon what you choose, the video will play, which will show a really good outcome if you made the right decisions, or it may show a less than optimal outcome. So that's what makes it fun. Some of the things that uh, we incorporated from, um, from this is just basically listening to our audience. Um, as Heather mentioned before, we did incorporate gamification, which is, for those who aren't familiar with the topic, it's basically just using game elements and game design techniques in a non-game context. So whatever you're teaching, you can also use or implement or make game design and um, put some of those gaming elements in your education. It doesn't necessarily have to be online. It can also be something that you do um, physically, like with cards or with a board or something like that. But it's just bringing some of the gaming elements into the learning to make it more interesting and make the learning stick. Um, so to access Misadventures in Money Management, you're going to go to mem.gov. And the storyline that we use throughout the program is based on a group of young people who all signed up for military service, and each of them have a different financial issue that they must face as they enter into the military. And they need your help to navigate the different options and the choices presented. When you go to MEM, your screen will look like this. You'll choose if you're a service member or a civilian. Then the next screen is, if you choose the service member, we're going to ask you what type of service. And so in this example, you see we clicked active duty. And then we ask you, OK, well, which branch of active duty are you with? And then we clicked Army. And then you click the Continue button. When you click the Continue button, then you get a screen that looks like this. Now, when we first implemented this program, which was back in 2016, we had a sign-in, and then we had this really long pre-assessment test. Based on feedback from um, young people in the delayed entry, from people in ROTC, and from active duty service members, they told us that was a roadblock to them actually doing a character. So listening to that feedback, we have today taken off the sign-in requirement. So when you go to mem.gov, you won't have to sign in, but it will still keep your progress if you want to exit out and come back. You'll get a code that will be um, shown at the top of the screen, and you can use that code to come back in to save your progress. Now each um, each branch or like each type of service that we have, for example, delayed entry. Um, delayed entry are those young people who are, uh, they signed up to go into the military with a recruiter, but they haven't left for basic training yet. So they're still a civilian, they're just waiting for their day to go into basic training. So they're officially still civilians. Uh, for those, they get a certain number of, they get a certain set of characters. Then we have an iteration of this for those in the Reserve Officers Training Corps, which is um, ROTC, and they have a certain set of six characters. We also have an iteration for Junior ROTC, and this year we actually launched the active duty portion of Misadventures, and they have another set of six characters. So the characters are based upon where the person is in the military life cycle, and then we assign those characters um, based on where they are and what things we feel they need to know at that point in the military life cycle. Now, before I give you a demonstration of it, I want to talk a bit about outcomes because all of us want to know, um, yes, you have a, a nice program, it looks neat and all that, but are people learning? And I can tell you positively that yes, when a person or a service member, when anyone comes to this page and they take the MEM program and they finish the MEM program, 
we look at that pre and post assessment to see if, if there's been some knowledge increases. And here's an example of one of those questions. You can see from here that um, when they come in, the question is, when buying a car, I should focus first on negotiating what? The monthly payment I can afford, the best trade-in value for my old vehicle, the total purchase price, or the car dealer fees. When they took the pre-assessment, 55.44% of people said a monthly payment I can afford. And that's not the right answer. The right answer is the total purchase price. At the end, when they took that post-assessment after taking this course, 76% said the total purchase price. So as you can see, knowledge improvement is taking place. That's a 43% improvement. Another question we have, a car shopper can require a salesperson provide, and then the four options are an independent mechanics assessment of the car, the pricing paperwork and out-the-door costs to purchase the car, the sales commission percentage, or their Federal Trade Commission license. And as you can see again, there's a 15.7% improvement from this one, which is B, which is the correct answer, 67% on their post assessment got the correct answer, which is wonderful. And those are the things that we want to see. So we do measure by using a pre-assessment and a post assessment to see if knowledge is taking place. Overall, I can tell you that the percentage of future and current service members who have, um, have scored higher on the post assessment than the pre-assessment is 74% which is absolutely wonderful. We're very, very happy about that. Now at this time, I would like to share my screen and show you the program. Um, are there any questions before I go on to the demonstration? I don't think I see any in the chat. I'm going to um, bring up my screen. But if there's any questions, just hit the chat button and type that in, and I'm sure Dr. Brown will help me answer those questions. Absolutely, and I don't see anything yet, So, um, but I am keeping an eye on it. Thank you. Okay. Now, one thing I do want to remind you of before I bring up the simulation is that if you go to our website and you click on Practitioner Resources, Service Members and Veterans, um, and then click on Misadventures, let me see if it'll a little slow, you'll get our Misadventures and Money Management page here. So this is the Service Members page. And then you can see this overview of MIM. Click that, and that will tell you everything about MIM that you want to know. There's a, a button to experience the adventure. There's a video that will give you an overview of it. There's videos from the Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel Daly, who is a proponent of MIM, really loves the program, so he did a video for us. You can see um, the branch battle where the, the branches in the military are competing with each other. As you can see right now, the Coast Guard has the highest completion rate. And then you can look by participation, and you can look at U.S. states to see who has the highest um, program completion rate. We have all of that. And you can see the top 10, all of those things. So there's, there's a lot of different things here that we put in, which, again, these are elements of gamification to try to drive like um, a way for them to, to play as teams against each other to get their um, interest in the program. You can see how many people from the Army have played, um, how many people from the Marines. So again, you can incorporate a lot of these things in your own learning if you'd like. Some other things on the MEM page that I want to show you is that if you want to order materials, like let's say that after I finish this demonstration and you're interested in um, getting some more information about Misadventures, on our Pueblo site where you can order bulk orders of information, we have the little miniature push cards that you can order. We have the sample comic books that, um, that you can order and then we have the flyers. And again, all of these things you can get for free. So I wanted to make sure I covered that, um, that you can order all of those things. And then also you can look at the comic books online because we provided the, um, the downloadable copy of it as well. So if you want to look at the comic books, see what that looks like, and then order some, you can do that. And the comic books are basically just going to give you a scenario of the first learning objective of some of the characters 
and then show you how to get to the um, to the website. So as I said before, um, this is what the page looks like once you self-select where you want to go. Remember I told you there is a re-entry code. If you've come to Misadventures before and you want to save your progress without it shutting down and starting you over, you just put in that code um, to start again, but there's no code required. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to play an introductory video that people will see when they come to Misadventures. And the introductory video basically introduces you to the characters and their financial problems. And then we're going to play one of these together. Um, I know the volume may not be the highest, but again, you will have access to mem.gov and you can play with this yourself. So you can watch this video again when it starts. So here we go. Uh, did things go wrong with these service members? Several friends signed up for military service and made bad choices with their money. Choices that could have been prevented. Now Angela struggles to simply buy groceries. Uh, you could try a credit. Thank you, Mr. Salvatian. Sorry. Didn't know it was a sensitive subject. You know, why do I have to buy all 12 eggs? Can I buy just, like, seven? And now Cruz's financial life revolves around his expensive new car. Sandwich. Thanks. I thought you were going to make money in the military. It's like money for food and, you know, a future. But this car is really cool. Dirk, of the top five money mistakes that service members make, he made all five. Whoa! He decided to live like a king on an 18-year-old's money and managed to for a very short time. Hello? No, uh, not the... That short time created a financial hole that okay. he may never get out of. Oh, really? Come on! And this is Maya, years from now, at age 23, after deciding to leave the military. Despite receiving several promotions, not only did she arrive home and have to move back in with her parents, she had to move back in with her parents. No keys. All those years, and nothing to show for it but a double bag. <sighs> I just want to go back in time. And James? James, unfortunately, spawned the fall of civilization. His financial choices were so bad, he initiated a zombie apocalypse. They're everywhere! Why do you care? Your job in this training program is to go back in time and to make better financial decisions as each of these service members. Make new choices so that Angela doesn't end up having zero credit and becoming that person. Cruz ends up having a life and not just a car. Dirk doesn't end up being a punchline. Maya isn't in a future of regret. And James doesn't spawn the downfall of civilization. Okay, so these may not be real people, but they do have real financial lessons to teach. And you need to care about your financial obligations and learn how to make positive choices with your money, or it could affect your success in the military. Get it? Go on each of their missions. Walk in their shoes. Make choices that change each character's financial future and learn how to control yours. Okay, so that is the video that plays when they first come in and start the adventure, and then they get to choose any of the characters that they want to choose. For this example, I'm going to bring up Cruz, and as you can remember from the video, Cruz's dilemma is his brand new car that he just bought. So we need to go back in time and see if we can make better choices for them. You'll also notice on this particular tool, which is mobile enabled, it's um, built on the web, but it's built for mobile devices. It can play on any type of mobile device from a Android, iPhone, um, tablets, all of those. That was one of the requests from our user groups that they really wanted to um, do the adventure when they had time or when they ran into a situation where they had a decision to make, they could quickly go somewhere and just find the answer and then move on. So we did that. And then also uh, one of the things that they don't like is reading a lot of instructions and directions. So you'll notice 
on the menus that we don't have instructions or directions. There's just things like start, which means click, <laughs> or scroll. And, and that's what you do. You just scroll down to see the adventure. Um, and that's one of the things that they like about the program. <clears throat> so with this one, Cruz, this is, this is Cruz right here. And he's got a car, but it keeps breaking down. And, you know, he's, he paid $200 last month, and then this month, $400. So he's thinking, you know, I think if I just buy a new car that won't break down, I won't be having these types of problems. So the question is, what's the first step in preparing for this battle? And this is where the audience will make the decision. So if you choose one path, it will take you one place. If you choose another path, it will take you on a different route. So I'm going to choose what you can afford and possible financing options. And so once you choose that, then it says that he made a good decision because he's now preparing to make a budget and he knows what price he can afford, so it's good negotiation power. And then after that, we give them a tip. And this tip can be saved by hitting the little heart, and you'll notice at the beginning menu there was a section for the content or lesson objectives and the tips. So if there's a tip that they really like, they can heart this or favorite it, and they can explore more. And this basically is information, a lot of the information we took from our CFPB website or from our ask questions, and we incorporated it here. So if we had a worksheet like how to use a budget, we would just click on that. I don't have that loaded here today. But if you click on that, it would bring up the budget and all these other things. So that's a good thing with the program. And then it says, you're tired, you've been training hard, what's the next smart move you should make? And then they get another set of questions. Should they rest because the salespeople are experts, or should you continue researching online? If they say, just rest, um, rely on the sales experts, then it gives them this part that, uh, you know, that might not be the best thing because you are giving up negotiation power because you don't have that important information. It's always good to have independent information, not good. And then we give them a tip to explain why researching is the best thing to do, and so on and so forth. So what I'd like to do now is go further down into the mission um, and show you what happens as a result. So if he goes through and he makes um, you know, different decisions, like I only want to focus on the monthly payment. Then he gets hit because he's losing negotiation power. The <laughs> and then he gets a tip about that, why that's a bad thing. Um, and then he's talking about his um, trade-in value, which is the dealer is offering him $2,000. He thinks it's only worth $1,000. So it goes on and on, and it asks him, should you go ahead and take the deal? And in some of these, when they make the wrong decisions, we don't want them to do that. So that's when we will tell them to try that decision again, if it's a fatal mistake. And that was a fatal mistake. So we're going to have him try that again and be skeptical of a too good to be true. So there are points in the lessons where we don't want them to make too bad of a choice. You want to stop them in their tracks and say, no, 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 let's go back because there are other things you need to look at. So then this is where he sees damage on the car, and he tells that to the dealer, and he says, um, you know, trying to distract him. So he's telling him, let's just take the car for a test drive, and now you need to make a decision. Should you accept his explanation and take the test drive, or should you demand a vehicle history report? So if we say demand the vehicle history report, you are able to block his, his response. I'll just say that. And so he says, I'll just take the VIN number down myself and get the information. So we're just, again, telling them about what they should do. Then we explain what is a VIN. Again, when they look for more information, we tell them where to find the VIN numbers, all of those things, where to look on the car to find it. 
because some of our young service members didn't even know what a VIN number was. So we thought that it's very important to let them know. I'm not sure if you un you know this, but in the military, like I was mentioning before, 60% of them have some type of auto payment that they're making. So this is a very, very hot topic, so to say, in the military, and we really want them to understand this negotiation process when they're thinking about buying a car, because when young service members enter in as an E1, E2, they're not making a lot of money. And some of them have found that um, it's been very stressful trying to make the car payment when um, the bill keeps coming month after month. So now this is something that happens when people go to the car dealer, you know, you've negotiated, but you're exhausted and you're tired and you're hungry and you just want it over. And that is another tactic that has been done to keep people, um, to, to, to rush people into signing the deal. So now he's saying that the car will be gone tomorrow. Um, let's just get this deal over with. And so your decision is, should you be patient or should you buy the car before it disappears? Let's say let's buy it before it disappears. And if you do that, he says, let's do the deal. He won. But again, we think that's a fatal mistake. We're going to tell him to try that decision again. Be patient because there's more lesson that we need to teach them. So here when we tell them to be patient, remember they can't go forward um, because that was a fatal mistake. We, we do keep track that they missed the question, but we let them know immediately that you can't go forward. So in this one, he's asking him to give him all of the out-the-door costs for the car so that he can take that information home and research it. So when he gets home, he sees that there's an important recall on the car, and he sees there's two fees that just don't make sense. Why are there two fees in this paperwork? He should remove those. So he calls back, and he tells them, can you remove the dealer prep fee and the dock fee? And then we have a deal, and he says, sure, no problem. And so when he gets there, however, Cruz actually reads the contract, and he says the dock fee is still in the contract. And the dealer says, I can't, you know, I can't sell you the car without that. It's normal. It's just $9 added to your monthly payment. <laughs> you know, he's telling him I'm selling you the car at a loss. And then there's another decision. Should you just pay the car, you know, buy the car with a fee, or should you be willing to walk away and start over? We're going to say buy the car with a fee. And when we do that, that's where the dealer says that victory is my destiny, and then you get an ending video. So let me show you this quick ending video so that you can see what the um, young person would experience from going through a, an entire um, lesson module. You okay, man? Yeah, you kind of look like I just punched you in the gut. Sorry, but you need a new car. They cost a lot of money. Yeah, I can see that. The next day. Sandwich. Thanks. I thought you were going to make money in the military. And you were demonstrating some kind of practicality and savvy that your peers are glad. Oh. Yet buying a car with that situational awareness of sales tactics is like, I don't know what's the right word, super dumb. Now you're like car poor. But this car is really cool. If you spent too much on it, no, it's not. Hey, Reggie. Hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. What's going on? And so it came to pass in his 18th year, our hero lost against sales tactics. He spent too much on his car, and his life briefly took a step back. Let's try this again. So as you can see, at the end of the mission, you know, we encourage them to try it again, or they can pick the different objectives that they want to correct. Um, if you do that, this is what the menu looks like. So the check marks will show you what you got right, and then these red X's will show you what you got wrong, and so they can go in and just fix those, go through the lesson, and figure out what was the correct answer. In the tips section, remember I was telling you about harding those? There are tips in each of the different lesson objectives, and if you heart those, it'll just take you immediately to those tips so that you can find more information so it's easy for them to find it. 
let's say that they didn't heart those, but they want to, they can still do that from here, not necessarily going back through the whole entire lessons. But these links will then take them to more information. Again, it's easy to kind of navigate yourself through it. When you're done, you go back to the menu, and now you can um, go to another character. Now, all of the characters are laid out differently. For example, um, I'm going to show you Sonia's, but we're not going to play the video. I just want to show you how hers is laid out differently. So I'm going to skip the video when it plays here. So in Sonia's narrative, she's coming back home after being in the military for a couple of years, and she's on leave for 30 days. And she noticed that her town is very gray, and she wants to do something to brighten it up. The reason why the town is gray is because people have been making bad financial choices. And Sonia's been handling her money very well in the military, and you know she's seen a PFM, which is a uh, personal financial manager, and um, she wants to share that good news with her town. So in this particular scenario, when she goes to a particular spot and she helps them, then color will come to the town. So that's how this one plays out. So when you start it, the only person who is in color is actually Sonia, but all the characters and everything in the town is in black and white or gray. But once she solves the problem, then the town, that scenario and that person becomes in color. So that's how that one works. And then as you go back to the mission, it'll tell you, okay, pick another part of the town. So you can pick another part of the town and you'll see how it lights up with color. Another scenario that we did, for each of these characters, everything is different. Um, as you can see with the crews, it was more like Mortal Kombat. Um, with Maya, it's a time traveler. With um, Angela, it's more of a, she has like a, a she's a warrior, and her um, instructor is teaching her that uh, saving for the future, you know, you need to start small and plant that seed to, so that your money can grow. Um, Xavier is, um, he's trying to save the world from an alien invasion, and um, he is getting calls from a debt collector while he's trying to save the world. So it's very embarrassing for him, and he's trying to figure out how to uh, stop the phone calls and address the issue, but also finish his mission. Dirk is another one that has a really good um, page or a landing page. Because after you make a decision for Dirk, his, um, his whole world changes a bit. So I'll show you that, and then after that, um, I, I will end the presentation. So let me go through this really quickly to show you how this one works. So let's say that I make some bad decisions, and um, uh, let's see. Leverage most of my pay for the next five years to own the car of my dreams. So when I return to see the outcome of that decision, you can see that at age 25, it says that uh, you chose to purchase a car that you could barely afford. For the first couple of years, you felt like the coolest guy in the world and you loved all the attention, but you couldn't shake the feeling that the well was running dry. At 25 years old, that's when the bills start piling up. And the car is five years old now, so it's not as shiny as you want. But when he's 30 years old and he has two kids, it's no longer the car of your dreams. It wasn't practical for the kids. You had it towed to the lot to trade in for a super nice minivan, and you spent the next decade trying to recover your credit. So a lot of our audience say that they like this character because every time they do a uh, lesson objective, they come back to this scene, and we can see what happens to Dirk at each age in his life. So now with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Brown and see if we have any questions. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I do see a question that came in from, from April that says, would you please identify what PFM stands for? Um, I'm not sure what she's referring to. Michelle, yes. do you know? I do. Okay. Um, personal financial manager, it's a oh, okay. 
it, for example, in the civilian world, it would be like um, the equivalent of going to a credit counseling agency to have them, you know, look at your budget and give you tips on the best way to pay down your debts, things like that. And at the military, they usually have one PFM, at least a minimum of one PFM at many of the bases um, around the country. Thank you. And I should know that because I spoke at a conference for a financial readiness to 300 PFMs, but for some yeah. <laughs> out of context, it, it didn't strike me. But, yeah. um, okay, great. That's a good question. Let's see if I don't see any other questions. Wait a minute. Oh, here it is. Let's see. Uh, what is the reaction? This is from Maria. What has the reaction been from civilians? I'm working on a thin lit program for incarcerated, soon to be released students. And I think this might be a good fit. Maria, that's a great question. And I agree with you. I think it would be an excellent fit. Uh, the reaction from civilians has been, wow, when are you going to have just the civilian version? <laughs> so that we don't talk about things like SCRA or MLA, you know, the things that are specifically related to military. And I am happy to say that we're, we're actually working on putting through our clearance process a version for the family members of service members, and that will be a version that um, civilians can use. And we're going to uh, be stripping out all of the really military-specific things out of that curricula. And we're hoping to have that rolled out um, this year, actually. Um, so we're looking at possibly maybe in three months or so, three to four months, I would say. It just all depends on, you know, the approvals that we get with the script that we're sending through. And if everything goes as well as we're planning, I would say in three to four months you'll see a civilian version out there for um, the family members of service members. And you could actually um, have this available for those students and let them take six of those characters. And I could even work with you to figure out which characters, you know, would work best and uh, make sure that they get that specific set of characters, depending upon, you know, what their age is. Uh, because the one that we're doing for family members, we're creating a new character right now, which is addressing marriage and having children, buying a house, and all of those things. So that's for our service members that are down the road um, in their career. And we have a civilian version and a military version for that. And then we do have characters that are more on the younger end. So um, thinking about getting their first credit card, um, buying their first car, those kinds of things. So I can um, work with you, Maria, to, to talk about which characters would be a good fit for your students. That's great. Um, and um, we also have a question from Deb Teague online. But before we ask it, I wanted to ask the operator if she would go ahead and give instructions to open the line in case there's somebody that wants to queue up a question. And after she gives the instructions, then I'll read Deb's question. We will now begin our question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 from your phone, unmute your line, and speak your name clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press star 2. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment as we wait for any questions. Thank you so much, Shauna. Um, You're welcome. Okay, uh, so Deb asked um, actually a couple of questions. It says, looks like a great tool. How do you get members to actually participate? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, since we're dealing with the military um, population, what we do is we work with the military leadership. As I showed you on our last page, um, on the MEM page where we had video testimonials from the Sergeant Major of the Army, we've worked with military leadership. So the senior enlisted um, Sergeant Major of the Army came out with us and uh, did a rollout of the active duty portion of the program. And then he told his leadership, listen, let's get this out into the hands of the service members and tell them to play it. I think it's cool. Play the game. So um, working with leadership is one way. Another way is we work with um, the recruiters. And so we send recruiters out shipments of comic books and push cards and flyers 
so that when they're working with a young person and that young person has signed up to go into the military, they can give them that card as a reminder to make sure they take MIM as part of their in-processing. In addition, um, there's a site called futuresoldiers.com where any new Army person that comes into the military, they have to go through that website to complete the training that they need before they go off to basic training, and Misadventures in Money Management is listed on that site. In addition, we work with um, TRADOC Command, which is um, the United States, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, and they are responsible for any training that goes out to Army, to Army people who are like, let's say, going from um, a specialist to a sergeant or going from um, a sergeant to a master sergeant, those types of trainings. We've worked with them, and I've actually uh, done the training for them. And they have embraced the Misadventures in Money Management program, and then we encourage them to take it. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to make it a required training for like um, ROTC or for active duty Army or for delayed entry, but it's very difficult to make a program a required training in, unless it fits with their mission of what they're supposed to do in the military. And so it doesn't fit that pattern. So what we have to do is just work with leadership to encourage them to take it. Um, we have encouraged um, notifications to go out to Army ROTC and uh, Navy ROTC. Um, they have sent emails out to all of the folks who are in the ROTC program, but they can't require it. They can just uh, encourage them to take it. And then we've also included it in their lesson plan. So they get a picture of the um, information to access mem.gov and then we encourage them to take the program and after they finish it, they get a certificate of completion and from inside the program, they can email that certificate of completion to their instructor, commander, or to their recruiter. So we've built that in there as another incentive to get them to finish the program. I hope that answers That's your question. That's awesome. Sounds like a really comprehensive um, marketing program that you put together. Um, Deb also asked, she said, it looks like our job is to market the program and encourage participation. And, and I'm certain that you would agree that any help that we can get from our intermediaries to push this tool and the website um, would Absolutely. be wonderful. And I think yeah. you also mentioned that you want, you're open to hearing ideas on other um, spins that we can put on this tool um, to mm -hmm. help other populations, such as the example for some previously incarcerated um, students that somebody else mentioned. So. Is there anything else you want to add about what you'd like um, this, in, this audience to do? Uh, basically, everything that you've mentioned, Heather, is excellent, right on track with what we are desiring. In addition to, you know, if this is a tool, like if, you're, if you have a program and you just want to supplement it with something, or, you know, you test out the characters and you say, you know, this Maya character actually addresses a lot of issues that I see on a daily basis, you can recommend that they go in and take that Maya character just to learn something. Because whenever you're talking about financial um, information, people need to hear it a couple of different ways. They need to hear it more than once. You know, you can't just say, make sure you save 10%. You have to talk, talk about it over and over, get them to set these things up automatically. And sometimes hearing it in a different way is another way to encourage them to do it. So I would encourage all of the people on the webinar today to just um, play around with the MIM program. And then if you see something that you're interested or that would work for your clients, please encourage them to take it. Um, just make sure that you are mindful that you tell them that this particular version was built for a military audience. So there may be some phrasing in there that they may not understand or that doesn't apply to them, but that's okay. Um, the overall goal of this is to teach them about money management. And I, I think it does a really good job of doing that through the comic book and through the videos. Excellent. I agree with you. Deb had also asked about what programs were for civilian employees, but you covered that really well. And you're welcome, Deb. I see your thank you. Um, operator, did we get any uh, questions in the queue? <laughs> uh, 
Operator? There are no questions. Thank you at this time. Okay, great. Um, I guess uh, we have somebody that said playing, so maybe they're saying that they are playing the game now. I'm not sure what that means, Arian, if you want to add something to the comments. But, um, oh, that's good. I love to see that people are playing it now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it looks like we've covered uh, – oh, no, there she just – let's see. She wanted to expand on that. Has anyone tried playing this during a class? I'm wondering if we can pull this up during financial training with first team members, first term members, to introduce concepts in a fresh way and maybe get them excited to explore further. That is a great question. And I will tell you that um, I had the pleasure of going out to uh, Joint Base San Antonio um, and um, to accompany our director and the Sergeant Major of the Army, and we actually played the game live with a studio with an audience of over 800 people. Yes, you can play it in the classroom. I love to play this as a group, and. What I did was I had given them a, um, a card ahead of time. We, we sat a card on the um, chairs. One side of the card was green, one side of the card was white. And when I brought up the questions after they would look through the scenarios, I would say, okay, which one should we choose? The first one, that's white. The second option, that's green. And so they would raise their card and either flip it green or white, and then the majority would win and we would um, select that decision, and we did the entire character with that huge audience of over 800 service members and their family members. There were some family members there as well, and it was so much fun. It, they were laughing. They were giggling. It was, it was hilarious, and it's very enjoyable, and it's great for the instructor too because you're sitting there letting them drive the learning, and it was wonderful. So I would encourage you to definitely do it as a group and have them choose which options they should go. And it's okay if, they, if, if there's a, a disagreement of which path to take. You can always go back and see what happens. Sounds great. Thank you for sharing that. It does sound like a lot of fun, and that's a lot. That's a huge audience for something like that to do an interaction with. It's not easy to come up with something, so that's, that's a great tip. I may have to use that myself at some point. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, operator, did any other questions come in uh, the queue before we wrap up? I do not have any questions over the phone at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you all, and a special thank you to you, Michelle. This was a wonderful and fun presentation, and um, I learned more things about uh, misadventures in money management than I already knew. I did not know about some of those metrics that you had the uh, different branches of the military competing. So I think that's really cool. So um, thank you for sharing this information, and I would like to have you back sometime next year because I know there are other new characters that are coming and some things that we can't even discuss at this point. But once we get releases on that, I would like you to come and update the audience about what's new with the tool. I would love to do that, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Operator, we're going to conclude now. Can you give the instructions? Thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.